Um, howdy, rock stars. Thank you so much for joining us here for this OWC webinar. I'm Lyd Shaw, and thank you for being here for this workshop hosted by OWC and Recording Studio Rockstars titled Mixing Advice for the Home Studio. Today, we have an awesome guest and an audio educator, Mark Rubel, joining us from Blackbird Academy, who will discuss the most important elements of mixing and how to get a professional sound consistently in your studio or in your home studio, wherever you're joining us from. Mark Rubel is a record producer, engineer, musician, author, consultant, expert, expert witness, and educator. Since 1980, Mark has made thousands of records at his Pogo studio in Champaign, Illinois, a very cool town, now located in Nashville. Champaign, Illinois is not located in Nashville, but Pogo Studios is now located in Nashville and elsewhere, including such clients as Hum, Allison Krauss, Rascal Flats, Jeff Coffin, Henry Kaiser, Fallout Boy, Ludacris, Adrian Ballou, Luther Allison, Jay Bennett, Melanie, Ian Hobson, Henry Butler, and many, many more. Mark is Director of Education and Instructor at the Blackbird Academy, an intensive recording school at the famed Blackbird Studios right here in Nashville, Tennessee. So um, welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. And that's all time we have. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so I'll close out. Um, Rockstars, please remember to turn off your phones and then use the questions feature in the chat area to post your questions so that we make sure that we catch them all. Um, we're going to do a full Q&A at the end of this teaching. Um, and feel free to just you know interject your questions in the middle and, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and also a big thank you to OWC for hosting this workshop. OWC is of course a great source for fast drives for composing and recording your music. And of course, reliable drives for your backup so you don't lose all your great work after you've created it in the studio. So now I'm zipping back over. Mark, welcome dude. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and I just want to start off with some thank yous also. Lidge, thank you for being awesome. And uh, thank you for the Recording Studio Rockstars, which is a great resource for everyone. And also thank you for all of your excellent work as an advocate for recording in, in Nashville. It's, you know, uh, it's what the ability to make records is what makes this community go around. It's been a tough year for everybody. And uh, I hope you know that you are much loved and much appreciated. Thanks, uh, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I also wanted to thank uh, all sorts of people. I want to thank Randy Fuchs and, and Tanya Fuchs for uh, helping set this up and setting it up and uh, connecting us and, and so forth. They've been a wonderful resource to me and to the school and to OWC for sponsoring it. Uh, and thanks for everybody for being here. Um, I just want to um, say that this is maybe a little bit different from your typical mixing uh, tutorial where somebody might show you a bunch of, of boss plugins or a bunch of killer uh, individual tricks and that kind of thing. I think it's um, more useful to maybe talk in the way that I teach, uh, which is that we're going to take it from the outside in. Uh, and I'm going to spend most of the time talking about philosophies and approaches and, and methods as opposed to specific techniques, um, because, of, because I have a philosophy of mixing, which is that all the specific things actually flow and follow from your overall concept of what you're doing. Um, so that should be fun. Uh, it's a bit of a race because normally this is something that I spend days talking about here in the classroom. And, uh, but I, I just wanna, I wanna summarize and uh, give you an idea and I look forward to hearing your questions and so on. Tell me if you see this first line. Yes, great. I'm seeing it over here, yeah. So okay. Rockstar, so, yeah, they see it, great. So this talk is sponsored by OWC. Uh, and among other things, they make amazing drives. Uh, and it's amazing how inexpensive stuff like this is. Now I, I'm insanely old. Uh, I remember proudly showing off when I bought a one gigabyte drive for my studio, which was $1,500. Uh, and it was quite large and I was very proud of it. Uh, and I'm very proud of this, which is a two terabyte drive. <laughs> and uh, it has, 10 gigabyte per second transfer rate. So this really, um, so I, I put that first um, because I really appreciate them bringing us together, but also it's, it is really important to back up your work. You, 
you want to be able to be responsible for it and uh, we are responsible to our clients and, and so on. Uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly based on our time. So uh, we titled this Tips for Mixing for the Home Studio, but really uh, the, the process is the same in whatever studio you're in. Uh, and, you know, it didn't used to be that way. It used to be very much of an expensive process. And it used to be that the tools drove the process. You know, you needed an SSL and you needed time code and you needed a console and you needed a, a room and you needed monitors. And those things were really only accessible to millionaires or people who were being paid by millionaires. Uh, we're so fortunate to be in this wonderful time where you have the tools. You can mix a great record if you spend whatever it is, 15 bucks a month on Pro Tools, or you know, if you have Cubase. And quite frankly, you, you can mix on anything. It, it doesn't matter if you're mixing on Audacity, if you're mixing on your phone. If you apply the, the proper way of thinking about it, um, you have the tools. If you have stock Pro Tools, which by the way, you know, at some point, a Pro Tools system like say here at Blackbird, with converters was $80,000. It was as much as a, you know, it is a console and tape machine put together, but it was, you know, almost as expensive as those things. So it is amazing how accessible it is. And if you have the basic Pro Tools, you have more tools at your disposal than any recording studio did 30 years ago. You know, nobody had an infinite number of, of full text or an infinite number of 1176s. So um, this is a, a wonderful development. If you know about Andrew Sheps and what a wonderful human he is and what a great mixer he is, it's both inspiring and slightly depressing to know that he's essentially working with the same things that we are. You know, it was easy in the past to say, well, of course, so-and-so is a better mixer than I am because if I had two neat consoles or if I had their, you know, the stuff they have, then I, I could do it too. But now, uh, you know, in some cases, he's working on a laptop, he's working on Pro Tools, uh, and he's mixing on Sony headphones. So this is a wonderful development, um, and it's inspiring because it means that you have unlimited access to it, you can practice, and, uh, and you can be great at it. Mixing is an art. I, I believe that very much. Uh, there are people that I know and people that I bring into the class who, who disagree. Um, and their name rhymes with Steve Albini. I'm just kidding. Um, but, um, you know, um, there are some people for whom uh, mixing, is, you know, I think something that Steve Albini will say is that mixing is basically problem solving. And I don't disagree. You need to solve the problems. And uh, according to some of my other points, um, it's better to uh, record the thing without problems so that mixing isn't salvaging, you know, or isn't, isn't problem solving. But in my opinion, mixing is an art. It's, it's as much of an art as, as anything. Filmmaking, it really is kind of like filmmaking, uh, making movies for your ears. It's sculpture, we're sculpting air in, in patterns that are pleasant or unpleasant or make people dance or make people happy. Uh, and we get paid to do it. Um, you know, we have a, a raw material that we're sculpting and forming and molding. Um, and everything that happens in all of the arts really applies to what we do. So yes, if you want to be a great mixer, you should study the work of every mixer that you can find. You should listen to as many recordings as many different types as you can uh, and watch all the tutorials and subscribe to Recording Studio Rockstars and, uh, and everything else. There's, there's an amazing amount of education and, and uh, you know, information now. Uh, there's a it's really the opposite problem uh, that people like me had when they were learning recording in the early 1930s, where there was no, uh, there was, there's essentially no information. I, when I got started, there was a book and I was lucky enough to find it. But if you wanted to know how somebody did something, you kind of had to guess. And we were poring over the photographs in the back of album covers, you know, and uh, trying to find stuff uh, in any way that we can. You know, I mean, I guess early on, there were a few magazines, recording engineer, producer, and so on. But um, there was not a glut of information. You had to start out sweeping floors in the studio or in the military or working in a radio station. Now it's a little bit the opposite, which is that everybody has so much information to choose from. 
the difficulty becomes figuring out what applies and what's, what helps you. And it's the same way actually in the recording process, as I just said, if you have Pro Tools, you have an unlimited number of possibilities and you can add, you know, emulations as the greatest equipment in the world for $29 or $500 to your system. Um, the process has become different, which is rather than building it from a limited number of possibilities and trying to make most of it, the process has become trying to choose from an almost unlimited set of possibilities. So that was all to say, definitely um, study mixers and mixing and, and learn everything that you can. Um, and of course, everybody starts as, as an artist by emulating other people and, you know, trying to, uh, to um, you know, copy other people and learning what they do. Uh, the good news and bad news is that we will never be them. We can incorporate what they do. Uh, and especially in the early days of learning, that's how painters learn, that's how sculptors learn. Uh, eventually, we, I encourage you to find the things that other people don't do and to develop your own style and your own sound. Uh, it's useful to know what other people do, but uh, partly so that you can figure out what they're not doing, if you see my point. Uh, so study everything that you can find about recording and mixing. There's a lot out there and it's amazing. Uh, but I would encourage you at some point to set the manuals aside and stop just watching uh, recording stuff. Uh, you can learn more about how to make a great record in some cases at some point by going to the art museum uh, or going to the theater or watching a really great film or reading some really great literature because recording, making a record is storytelling. Uh, this is at the heart of what humans do, right? We communicate, we tell our story, we tell our story to other people. Uh, we're constantly exchanging stories and anecdotes of it, but in some ways our own lives and our own realities are stories that we tell ourselves and others. Um, storytelling is the heart of being human. And there are, have been so many incredible stories or incredible is a bad word because they're very incredible. There've been so many wonderfully told amazing stories. Um, and you can learn as much about, in some cases you can learn more about how to make a, an effective record that communicates artistically and fully. Uh, and by the way, that, in my opinion, is also more likely to make it commercially successful. I think that good commerce, that great commerce follows great art. Um, so I think you can have a better chance of doing that by studying the great and enduring art of all kinds. Uh, you know, if you see how acting works and watch the actor's workshop or just really watch a great actor at work, that's what your vocalist is. You know, voc singing is acting. And the more that you can facilitate it, the more you can present it. Um, the better. And all of that is, is really what we're doing in the process of mixing. So um, filmmaking, I, I have a plan that's not done yet, but I'm planning to try as an experiment teaching mixing in here in the classroom uh, by analyzing a scene from a Kurosawa film. Because I think if you pick the right scene of a movie, you can teach everything that people need to know about mixing. Uh, Placement, movement, scale, colors, textures, uh, framing things, lighting, contrast, right? All of those things are, are can you, you know, you could encapsulate in something like that. I, I'm not sure everybody would actually hang with me, but I'm still going to try. Um, so my advice is to study all of the arts and to study what everyone has done. And then eventually, or now, go beyond and figure out what other people haven't done. Uh, how do you get great at anything? You, by doing it. You know, the, the 10,000 10, hours uh, Malcolm Gladwell mastery idea. Uh, it seems as though some people are just born into the world with amazing talent. We can't figure out how, how they do it. Uh, they have probably worked really hard to get there to develop that talent and to develop the skills. So. How do you become a great mixer? By mixing uh, a lot. And, and again, you don't have to book a recording studio for $2,000 to get to sit behind the console. You have a laptop device that you can carry around uh, and you can be on a plane, you can be in a boat, you can be on your porch, you can be at your kitchen table. 
uh, and mixing, which um, is a, an amazing thing to get to do. Uh, and by the way, practicing recording is very similar to practicing a musical instrument, which is if you continue, if you look at practicing as just reinforcing the things that you already know, you won't develop, right? So the idea is to uh, push the boundaries you know, what is this thing that I've heard about that I have never experienced? Or here's a new plugin. Uh, you should do what everyone's always done through the history of technology, turn everything all the way up, right? And, or try using, you know, oh, gee, here's a, I've got a new bass drum microphone. What does it sound like on everything but bass drum? Um, okay. I hope everybody's with me. Uh, yeah, this is great, man. Let me know if you want me to jump in so you get a breather for a sec. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a couple more points and then we'll see how the, how the questions are going and how many of them are, are you freaking kidding me? Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, my next point, mixing is production and production is mixing. These are intertwined. Uh, I used to think of those being completely separate processes and that didn't serve my uh, mixing in particular. At this point, I think that, uh, you are mixing from the second you start actually pre-production because what is mixing is deciding what it's going to sound and feel like in the end, right? So uh, you're mixing from the moment you decide, you know, we're gonna use your drum kit, not our drum kit. You're mixing from the moment you decide, I'm gonna point this microphone here or here, uh, you know, it, and or from the moment you go, you know, that guitar is out of tune, I think we should tune it up. Um, that doesn't sound like mixing, but what, if the guitar is out of tune, it will not sit in a mix and it'll stick out. That has to do with the mixing. You understand tuning is, is as much of a mix issue as anything else. If you take the guitar out of, you know, if you have the guitarist tune it perfectly, um, it will blend in. It's really hard to get it to stick out. Um, and since what we're really trying to do is communicate and realize the character and the personality of the art and the people that made it, um, you know, if we take the guitars out of the punk rockers' hands and make them perfectly in tune, that may not serve the art. So I'm, I'm, if, I'm just saying, you are starting the mixing process for the very second you record something. And so I guess I have it backwards. Production is mixing. And uh, mixing is production. So we have the, that's one sort of the next to last stop in the technical process before mastering. And this is a place where we have a, a chance to calibrate or redo or make the final decisions in uh, the art of making music. Any art, including music, film, painting, sculpture, cooking, uh, any art is really a process of decision-making, right? If you look at a painting, you, you see the, uh, artifact, that's why we call it art. You see the artifact of the artistic process or the creative process. So this is what the person chose to paint and this is what they chose to leave out. This is how, what they chose to, whether to make it abstract or representative. They chose what colors to make it, whether to make it bright or dark, or contrasting or etc. cetera. Um, we're doing the same thing. We're painting with sound and we're making all those decisions. So um, some of the production decisions get made in the mixing process. Okay, I'm gonna say a couple more things and you can let me know how we're doing for questions. There are many tools now. Uh, as I say, you have access to many tools. Uh, there's certainly lots of different techniques and there are templates you can load something in, but you have to be aware. Uh, you know, you see a lot of recording magazines or websites and they're trying to get people to click on it. It's always, you know, 23 killer tips and tricks to whatever, create, create a, a explosive killer, um, et cetera. Um, the, um, yes, there are, there are methods for doing things, but there is no recipe book. Um, you just have to be, you know, the, an example would be you get a, uh, a plugin and it has presets and you go, aha, uh -huh, this, this preset has a famous person's name on it. Therefore, if I take this preset, I'm gonna have their techniques and so forth. Well, all of these things are completely um, context dependent. It all depend on you know, what, how you're gonna set, say a plug in the compressor, completely depends on everything else in, in the recording. Uh, so for us to think, oh, I'm gonna get a killer kick drum sound because I read an article that says, if you uh, EQ out 200 Hertz and 
uh, boost 50 hertz and then you set your compressor to five to one, um, that's going to be it. Um, then we probably are doing it wrong. Uh, it's actually a matter of opening your ears and your mind uh, to figure out what needs to be done and then doing it. If you approach it with a, with a this sort of preset recipe book of here's how to solve different things, um, I, uh, if, if it works, that's great, but I'm encouraging to approach each project with, with fresh ears and fresh mind. Uh, you know, just to go back to one of my examples, you know, the killer bass drum sound and you should EQ it this way. Um, unless it's a solo bass drum record, even so, it's not going to work, right? So what bass drum is it? How, what diameter is it? What kind of heads? How many heads? What's the beater made out of? How heavy does the drummer play? Do they leave their foot on the pedal? Uh, what is the bass guitar or bass instrument? What is it playing? Uh, and then everything else, because everything affects everything else. So um, it would be lovely if we had a mixing tips for the home studio where I could just say, okay, here you go. You want everything to sound great? Just do this and set it to four. It, it's a, uh, it's not that easy, right? It's you. Um, yes, you can paint by numbers, but you're going to end up with somebody else's painting. Uh, it's challenging, exciting because we have to we have to figure our way and we have to stay fresh. That is actually is the process, not coming at it with preconceived notions. Uh, and I would encourage you to do the same thing in recording. You know, just because some mic technique once worked for you on an instrument or you were taught to do it a certain way. Um, you won't learn and develop if you don't just keep trying things and experimenting. Probably a good time, Blidge, to see what people are. Sure. You know, I, I've had so many thoughts pop up just hearing you talk about this stuff. Um, Cheers. Going, going in reverse very quickly. Um, one of the fun things that I like to discover is you have frequencies. So I, I did everything you just described about a kick drum. I'm, I'm quite certain I did that this afternoon to a kick drum. And one of the things that's kind of fun to do is find that thing that you think you're supposed to formulaically take out of a sound and do the opposite, but to try boosting it on your next mix and be surprised at just how cool of a thing you can get going. You start taking the muddy frequencies and you just start turning them up and amplifying them. It can do some really, really cool things. So it's fun to like um, think that way, you know? And I loved your, your uh, Kurosawa um, analogy too. I was gonna ask you which, uh, which movie you would pick if you were going to do that seven samurai is probably obvious that's but I, I haven't i haven't decided we have a filmmaker in our class who suggested some scenes i'm 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 gonna i'm gonna check it out i'm still thinking about it but yeah i, I like the idea uh, along with your your kick drum i also do uh that sort of thing where um i'll just go basically anytime somebody tells you this is the way to do it you should try doing the opposite um i'm lucky enough to get to teach class where i'm not necessarily on a client's time uh, and I will, uh, okay, hang on. Uh, you got an incoming? I, I've got some message I'm not quite understanding. Uh, we, got, we got No Way Yojimbo. I think maybe that's a Kurosawa movie we don't know. Okay, about. yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, so, you know, just sometimes because I'm on uh, in a classroom, I can just try like upside down stuff. So, for example, I, I'll do upside down drum sets where I'll use the a beta 52 for an overhead and, you know, yeah. put, put the overhead mic in the kick drum or a lavalier or something like that. And it's, a, it's amazing how hard it is to screw it up. You always come out with something interesting, possibly more interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we have questions? Um, sure. Yeah, we do. I just I'm wanted to say one. For one second. Go ahead. I just wanted to say one thing before we go to that, just to reiterate your point of um, mixing as an art form and, you know, uh, you can get a Pro Tools subscription. One is I've heard people sometimes talk about the the um, idea of subscriptions and the, and the expense of it. And I was remembering um, what it used to cost to go buy stacks of ADAT tapes when we wanted to record on, on ADATs back in the day. So it's actually far more affordable to record now than it, than it ever, ever has been, which is remarkable. And um, the other thing is, you know, like everybody's Pro Tools certified and everybody's got a, um, the same plugins. So what does that leave you? It leaves you, the individual and your personality and what you want to bring as the story is the most valuable um, element to bring to your mixing. So we do have a couple of questions here. Yep. Um, these, these came in, um, we've got a few that were submitted early and then we got these ones right here. So I'll, I'll start with this. Here's one from John Murphy. Um, he says, 
do pros use ozone ozone nine for mastering? So this is pretty plug-in specific, but uh, you know we always want to know stuff like this. Oh, there goes one of my lights. <laughs> pros uh, don't use those lights. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We had a pro in uh, class today, Leland Elliott, a great mixer and uh, engineer, and he had ozone on his master bus. So I can definitively say the answer is yes. Awesome. There you go. Good question, John. Um, here comes another one. Let's see. This one is from Sergio. Uh, Sergio says, in this analogy with filmmaking, would you say that space time effects like reverbs and delays are the element to set the scenario where the story develops? Could you expand on the use of this effect? Thank you. Certainly. Well, um, that's one of them. Uh, you know, it. Luckily, we can play with everything that's in the mix. So, uh, which is one of my next next points. So, we have many uh, different things that we can change to tell the story, just the way you can with film. You've got color and placement and size and depth of field and so forth. So, uh, re as far as reverbs and delays go, I mean, um, those translate psychoacoustically in our brains to space, space and time. So, those probably would be the first things that we would go for because um, our brains are trained to recognize a large, uh, you know, a, a, a long delay as that we're outside or something like that. So you, we can use that to position things, uh, it, you know, closer or farther away or to make something uh, or, and to create the, uh, the space that the story is happening in. Uh, so that's, that's what you do in a, in a movie or in a, a, if you have a play, right? The, the uh, curtain rises and you wanna know where you are and you look around the set. So in a way, it, it is this way that we can build the, the ambience in the set and so forth. And it's an also depending on what we use and how we do it, whether it's an abstract story or a very uh, naturalistic story, right? Do we have stuff that's exploding or we have something that's in our faces when it has 10 seconds of reverb or does it all feel like it's in a space? So every, uh, every element that we use and how we choose to use it tells a story in a different way. I, um, do you I, remember the band, the Rocketeens? Vaguely. So, so uh, thinking about reverbs and spaces too, it just, you know, you think about how things are placed in space and it's f so much fun when you discover a band like those guys where like everything was doused in spring reverb. So like, but you can still create space around a sound, a sound you know, and put it together like that. And I have a question for you. Mark, that's that's sort of spinning off of what um, Sergio asked, which is, you know, the idea of we're always mixing. So I understand that as, as um, always mixing, like we're selecting the sound. What, if we're adding something, you know, if we're putting a whole band together in a recording, then we're adding sounds that all add up in that moment. Sometimes we're adding a sound afterwards that needs to fit into the moment and we're, you know, building the house one brick at a time kind of thing. Um, so my question is how much, like um, how much mixing are we doing? Are we getting super tweaky, uber tweaky with every addition? Or is it like you're mixing, but you know that you can still come back and sort of put it all together later? Uh, so, uh, so I'm sorry, are you talking about during the recording process? Yeah, or, yeah. So in other words, if you're, if you're always mixing and you're thinking about the mix while you're adding something, mm -hmm. you know, how much room, how, how tweaky do you, do you get with it in that moment? that's too tweaky and, and how much do you leave for later to kind of glue it all together? Well, it's, it's a difficult question because uh, we certainly don't wanna to be tweaky to the point where we're impeding, we don't ever wanna impede the creative process. So if we're sitting there experimenting, moving mics around by a half an inch while the artist is getting bored, that's too tweaky. Um, on the other hand, it, to, if we have good enough technique, or we're able to find the sound in our head fairly well, my general feeling is, uh, and my general approach is, I try to make the record in the recording process. Uh, I, if I'm doing it the way that I consider it to be right, then I've spent 80% of the time recording it and getting the sounds the, the way that I want them to be. And so this, excuse me, this mixing process that we're talking about is, is, a, is considerably short, it's 20% of the time. And a lot of it consists of not trying to screw it up and and then polishing it. And then if there were any problems that got built in, fixing it. So I, I think it's worth front loading the process and spending more time at the beginning, as long as you're not, like I said, boring your, your clients. Um, 
it's worth taking the time to get it right. I think there's, uh, you know, whatever it takes to get a, an end product that works for someone. But I think there's a lot of um, what I'd consider to be lazy recording. Like, oh, I'll just, I'll, I'll put up 30 microphones. I'm sure one of them is going to sound good. Or, you know, I'm just going to get any old mediocre sound and then I'm going to replace it with samples. Well, just use the samples in the first place, right? Uh, you know, or I'm, you know, I'm sure it, I'm going to, you know, we're going to, it'll be, it sounds strange now, but I'm sure it's going to be good later. And then there's that very pernicious uh, saying, you know, oh, I'm going to fix it in the mix. No, fix it now. <laughs> That's what we do. We're, we're affixing things in time, right? We're, we're freezing them in amber. We're capturing lightning in a bottle. Let's, let's get it now because, uh, it's very easy to deceive oneself and end up with a mess at the end, you know, uh, and, and try to front load that, those decisions. You know, I, for example, I usually try to keep maybe three vocal takes and make sure that there's one that we really feel great about. We might have some others if we later we decide, well, you know, we'd like a little different interpretation with lines. But uh, I think to keep the options open too long and then decide that the mixing process is going to be all of these going to be 80% of the production. Um, if it works great, but I think that it's faster, cheaper, and tends to get you to where you want to go more effectively. If you, if you do it early in the process. Yeah. So that, that brings, that reminds me of the old pro tools joke, which of course now would just apply to any, any studio DAW joke, which is um, the band finishes their take. And then the engineer gets on the talk back and goes, that was terrible guys. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, let's jump to some questions. Here's one from Donnie. Um, Donnie says, Mark, should we know more about the artist and what is being used as for instruments? So I think maybe that means, um, you know, maybe that's the mixing part of, uh, maybe you can explain, Donnie, but jumping in and, and really like making sure you really know who this person is you're about to record in the instruments. How do you interpret that? Um, one of the points that I have on my endless list of stuff to talk about is, is uh, having a vision for what you're doing. And so that would include, uh, you know, the artists, like, and, and really that's why one of the most important parts of the process is communication. So uh, what are they going for? Do they want this to feel like a live performance? Do they want something that's completely abstract and just a bunch of sounds that don't even sound like instruments, right? Um, are they... Uh, yeah, you know, what is what is the goal? Are they trying to really fit into a genre? Are they trying to break a genre and do something different? Uh, you know, and what is it about the band that, and which would include their instruments? What is, you know, to be able to have the instincts to know what is the personality of this band? What is it that makes this band interesting? And the funny thing about that is sometimes, and this gets into being a producer. And so if there's a producer, then that could be uh, tricky. But, you know, in communication with the producer and the Band. You know, sometimes the band doesn't recognize the things that make them great, or they try to minimize the things that actually are most interesting about them. So to have the instincts to, to uh, be able to figure that out and feature it. And, you know, I mean, what is it that makes that drives this band? What is it that makes their music interesting? Is it the interplay between the rhythm guitar player and the kick drum? Is it the lyrics? Is it the, the sound of somebody's clangy snare drum, whatever, you know, um, and and how can you uh, you know and and how can you not not lose that and not genericize them and uh, you know and then uh, feature it really should I go uh, you got more questions or should I go back oh, to uh, uh, your call we got a few questions we can probably okay. circle back to them if you want and let's do that I'm I'm gonna go forward okay great we'll come back cool? more, yeah okay. rockstars keep adding questions and we'll keep getting to them in different question breaks groovy because. Um, I, I don't know how to make this smaller than my face, but I'll, I'll, I'll go on. Okay, so we talked about a bunch of stuff. Let me get us to where we were. Um, you know, a, a lot of this is, is philosophical. And I would say another point is, um, in addition to developing your techniques, like, oh, I, I know how to balance low end, or I know how to, I don't know, you know, auto-tune or something like that. Um, it's it's important to have to build a framework uh, of your to build your own philosophy of how you do things. Communicate so that that gets to our last point, right? Um, in other words, if you go and you think uh, I know what this band needs, and or I'm going to go this way, this is my sound, and you're trying to force their music into your sound, and it's not what they want, 
it might be great, you might think it's great, but uh, they might not. So, you know, it's communication is just so important in everything, in life and business, and it's really important in the creative process. So, um, you know, be effective at presenting the options, but, not, but be diplomatic and also psychological enough to not give artists too many options where they'll just get, go off into the wilderness and get lost, right? So try, try to help direct the whole process. So, and this also gets to something that we were just talking about. So if you recorded it, then you have some idea of what you were going for, and that's a little bit easier. If you're mixing something that somebody else recorded, I think some people have a tendency to go, okay, well, whatever, they recorded this way, but I've, I'm the great wizard, and I have the sound, and I'm going to jam this thing into the box that represents my sound. I'm going to ignore whatever they've done. Um, so, you know, uh, and this really goes to communication. So what were they trying to do? Uh, how did they get these sounds? Is this the, the state that they left it in when they were done recording pretty close to what they wanted? You know, and then in which case, maybe it's not our job to go in and take it completely in another direction. Maybe it is. It's a matter of communication. Uh, pay close attention. Well, be knowledgeable of and aware of your monitoring. Um, you know, it, nobody's going to be able to it, nobody's going to complain about your mixing if you mixed on Logic instead of Pro Tools or if you mixed in Ableton or whatever it is. Um, they, they're, so a lot of the things that people obsess over um, are less important, but, when, but the, something that's really important in mixing is being able to hear what you're doing. So it's worth investing in, in monitors and really learning uh, the room and uh, the, the monitor room combination so you know what it's telling you. You just have to know what it sounds like on the system that you're mixing on. Uh, so you have to know what it has to sound like on that system in order to translate well. So just be, be aware of what your monitor is tell you, telling you and um, you know, work on it. If it's easy to change rooms with common materials you can get at a hardware store. And if you just find, uh, I'm consistently putting too much low end in my mixes, you're not hearing enough low end in your, in your room. So move the speakers closer to the room or whatever. And be careful of the levels because the sound of your hearing uh, the equal loudness curves. The sound of your hearing changes depending on how loud you're listening and you get different information. So um, be aware of that and also don't deafen yourself. Your ears are irreplaceable. This is something that I started to say earlier. Um, I think that, and this is something I talk about at great length normally, but I'll, I'll try to keep it briefer. Uh, I think a lot of people just go in and they think that mixing is doing, right? And so they, they go, oh, here's a song I must mix. I've seen this YouTube video, somebody putting five plugins on the vocal. So I'm gonna put five plugins on the vocal. And they, they're, they're doing stuff and, they're, and they think they're gonna sort of derive a final product by doing a bunch of, of unrelated things. Uh, I think like any artwork or creation or anything, a trip, uh, your life, it really helps if you have a vision and a goal. Uh, and so you can derive this through the things I talked about earlier, which is communicating with people. So, you know, what, what are we trying to do? Are, are we trying to make it feel like you're in a punk rock club with a band that's playing 110 dB? Are we trying to make it give the experience that you're in a concert hall and there's the most amazing symphony orchestra? Are we trying to portray that you're floating in space and there are aliens and laser beams going around you, right? Um, what is the vision? And um, I have my own process because I have this uh, this sort of pseudo literary uh, filmic approach to it, which is I, I'll write down a word that relates to, or a phrase that relates to the song. You know, it'll, it'll just write down, you know, this song feels, and then I'll say in my synesthetic self, I'll say, you know, the song is meant to be luminous or raging or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, uh, here's a nice word, crepuscular. Uh, you know, it's, it, this, this, it's, it's the evening. Right? It's so I have this vision of somebody in the evening, the, the sun's going down, they're there. And, and if you start with that vision, all those minor details of which compressor should I use and what plug, how many plugins and all that, you can derive that from the vision. It's a lot easier to do that because then the decision is should I compress the vocal? Well, does it serve the vision? Right? And then when I say draw it, I literally um, just draw a bumpy line that represents the energy profile of the song. So starts out the intro and it builds up and it goes here and then there's a big energy peak and then there's a drop and so forth. And so, I, so you have something to refer to when you get lost in the details, you can just listen to it and go, okay, is it, is it kind of following this or did we start out with all the levels at the beginning 
and then it just sort of gets dis disappointing as, as it goes out or, or what have you. Moving quickly, said that, drive the mix and the vision, not the other way around. Um, but don't be so dogmatic about the, the, your vision. No, I must realize this thing that you're not open to the unex unexpected. So if you're going along and you go, wow, this is kind of going in an unexpected direction. I didn't plan to put a million gallons of reverb on all this stuff, but it's kind of cool. Um, you could follow it. And it's you know wonderful when you're in a doll world where you can go down the rabbit holes and you can figure out what's too much, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. This is what I'm talking about. Create an experience, tell a story, make a movie, right? Depict a character. I mean, how does any story or movie or anything happen, right? You introduce the character or characters, you introduce the situation, you introduce the, the space or the time, right? It's a portrait. And then something has to happen or it's going, you're going to lose the interest of, of your listener, which is, by the way, the real goal of doing all of this is if you've really done a great job and you did everything uh, as well as it can be, the thing we're really hoping for is that somebody listen to the song and when they get to the end, they go, I have to hear that again. Or they immediately say to their friends, you have to hear this. And by that, they don't mean hear this, they mean experience it. So um, that's going back to my studying the arts part. Um, we have great examples in everything from HBO movies to Shakespeare, of, uh, to all the mythology and all the, the religious storytelling of the world, the Norse sagas and Homer uh, and Jungian psychology. We have all the examples of how to tell stories and how to make a song about more than just, I love you, uh, you know, that it represent, or you know, whatever it is, you know, that it just be about something prosaic, that it can represent something more that more people relate to. I would add that we also have plenty of examples of a high budget film that wasn't worth watching, even though they had all the special effects and all the fancy cameras. Yep. That's, um, I, I have my own AES law, Audio Engineering Society, Rubel's Law, uh, which says, uh, great music badly recorded will always be great, uh, and crappy music wonderfully recorded will always be crap. So I think we have to keep in mind that uh, we're the conduit and we're the frame, but we just have to be effective at, at delivering the story. And even, and you know, for some things it, it you could have a, a primitive painting by Grandma Moses or something like that. If you put it in a hundred pound Baroque gold frame, that's ineffective, right? So, yeah. So hopefully, yeah. So hopefully, I think I've, I was trying to stop using the terms good rec relating to recording and, and go more for effective. Yeah. Do you want to do, do a couple more questions and then we'll, we've got about probably seven questions lined up or something like that. So whenever you're ready. Sure. Hit me. I've got about oh, seven more. Do points. it now. Okay, great. Let's go. Um, so let me jump in. We had we had a few early submissions too. So um, I'll start with this one. This one comes in from Chaz. Shout out to you, Chaz. Thanks for being here. So Chaz says, "Hi, Mark. First, I want to thank you again and the entire Blackbird team for the amazing hospitality when I was there in July of 2019 for Warren Hewitt's masterclass. Yeah. Your tour. Uh oh, my screen's going off there a little bit. Your tour was awesome." Um, I, you know what? I can't read the rest of it. Sorry about that. It's sort of gone, gone off. Screen. Thank you. It was fun. Let's see if I can do that. Maybe that helps. Oh, and I got some amazing quality time with uh, Lowell and Richard Dodd. Awesome. I'm curious what advice you would give to people who are starting to build a home studio in this regard. How would you prioritize the importance of these items to help people just starting out to get the best results? One, acoustic treatment and control room st set up, two, studio monitor selection, three, microphone selection, four, plug-in selection, five, DAW selection. Thanks again, hope all is well. Best regards, Chaz. I, I think you kind of addressed those already, but you, if you wanna add anything about that, that would oh, be great. What's hilarious is I think that's about the order I put them in. Uh, so uh, I would say room and monitors work together. So I think the most important thing is to have a, a reliable listening environment. Um, and probably I put monitors first uh, because that could include headphones. If you have a room that's not workable or you have, don't have a budget to make a room workable, then you just wear the speakers on your head and then you don't have to worry about it. So uh, if the budget is low, then a, a really uh, good set of headphones is, is excellent. So rooms, 
room and monitoring is most important. And I see people that prioritize it the other way. They have a fancy console, they have amazing compressors and microphones, and um, and they have their monitoring system, they can't really hear what they're doing. And then you're just guessing. So I, uh, and uh, then I think microphones, I generally advise investing in the outside parts of it. So the listening part and the microphones, because we have good or great microphones, which are very accessible these days, um, and you know how to use them, then you can get great results by aiming them at the instruments. Um, oh, and by the way, instruments. So, uh, so I would start with monitoring because you can make great record, great record with 57s, you know? And then I would go to the other end. I mean, obviously you have to have something to record on through, but, and then I would go to the other end and have wonderful instruments. You have a great snare drum or piano or guitar or amp or whatever, um, and microphones, and then fill it in in between um, and the way that I generally advise buying equipment is not to buy the equipment or, and not to buy it because somebody tells you you need it, buy capability. So buy the ability, if you, you just have to ask yourself, you know, what are the, what's the shortcoming or what's holding me back? I can't get a great guitar, vocal sound for all I try. Maybe you need a better vocal mic or I can't control the volume of it. Okay, maybe you need a compressor. So uh, buy the capability, not the equipment. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be negative, right? It could be that you just hear a cool sound come from somewhere and you'd like to try having that color in your studio. Or it makes you happy to have a piece of gear that, with flashing lights, which is completely also... Uh, Happiness is a good out. color for the studio. Good. Uh, okay, here's another question. This one comes in from David Gann. He says, I would love to take a short course at Blackbird Academy for serious home recording hobbyists. Any chance you could develop a curriculum for this? What's your thoughts on that? It's possible we, we have a, a grand total of four people on the faculty and we're teaching two classes full time. We do uh, summer camps for high school people. We've had a lot of requests for that kind of thing, but I think it's mainly just a matter of, uh, of uh, our available resources. It's, we try to keep very, things very small and streamlined. So um, I, we'd love to do it, but I don't know if we will anytime soon. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the things that you do so well is you, you really make sure everybody who is in your class is included and well taught. Um, here's one from Sergio. He said, low frequency monitoring isn't always accurate in a home studio. Would you recommend some sort of visual cue to get levels right? If so, what specific plugin or plugins could you recommend for metering to help us balance the lows? Thank you very much. There are a few ways to go. I mean, actually I found headphones to be more useful than I, than I used to. Uh, a reference system, even if it's a car, can be helpful. Uh, a subwoofer can be helpful if, unless you're living with or near other people who are going to be annoyed by it. Uh, if you can't really reliably, and this is a very common scenario, really tell what's going on in the low end, there are visual ways to do it. I mostly recommend against mixing with your eyes. I see people do it too much, but I think it's it's reasonable. And the, the tool that I recommend um, that I've, used as Isotope Insight, which is uh, a good way to do it. And there are, there are many others out there uh, where you can, uh, you can kind of get some kind of visual idea. There's a funny thing, which is some speakers like uh, Pro-X have a front facing port and they puff you in the face when the bass drum is, <laughs> is right. too much or about right, you know? And so uh, that sort of thing, it, it, is, it is difficult. And um, low end is so much more critical in, in modern music than it used to be. I mean, actual low end, we're talking, you know, from 20 to 80. It's so much more present than it used to be, you know. Yeah. Um, we just, there wasn't really a way to recreate it, to play it back mm -hmm. until more recently. Um, okay, very cool. So here's another one. This one comes from, um, and then if you want to jump back into teaching, you just let me know, Mark. But here comes one. This is from Al. And yeah. Al says, um, do you consider a central motif when mixing an album? If so, do you have an approach to choosing that sonic theme? Yes, I guess what I call it was vision, but I think motif is, is really nice. And uh, yes, so, uh, and of course that can vary from song to song, or it might be a, a, there may be a through line, you know, and you could look at it as different chapters in a novel or, or, uh, or what have you. Uh, but I think the, the really short answer is yes, but, and that's, that's the way that I tend to think about it is, you know, what's, what's the motif or what is it that's making this story effective or that's portraying this band or this artist, you know, the sound of their voice, the, 
your image of them? Does it suit them? You know, I mean, if you think of Chris Stapleton, you sort of picture the guy. And when you hear him, you kind of picture that guy. You know what I mean? So what he was a great singer and a great performer. And the songs are great. Uh, but what are you trying to portray with that? I think it's it's him. It's the essence of, of him. So I would I would say that. And I'll just add with this whole, uh, you're lucky because I talked for days in this classroom about all the stuff that I'm summarizing fairly quickly. Um, it sounded very over-intellectualized and as though I'm sitting there pondering for hours and, and uh, writing out diagrams and, and reading Kant, you know, or something. Um, all these things I'm talking about really happen instinctively. It comes from a lifetime of, of listening and thinking about stuff. So it's not like I'm sitting there pondering and having deep therapy sessions with my clients. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it kind of comes to me more or less in an instant when I hear the song. Okay, I can sort of feel like what this song could be or what it wants to be. Of course, it depends greatly on what your role is. If you're the engineer, um, it's not really your job to impose your vision on it. Um, it's to realize the vision of the producer and the artist. Uh, but if you're the producer, it is your job to figure out what the vision is. And depending on what kind of producer you are, it might be to dictate it. So uh, it, it, it depends very much. But I'm, I just want to say that it is something that I think about a lot in these terms, but it, it happens uh, almost instantaneously. Yeah. Um, cool. So let me jump forward. Um, all right. So this is one from Andy. Andy says, I'm staying with the movie analogy. Do you ever storyboard a mix or is it more a more organic process? Which again, I think you answered some of that, but storyboarding is what I thought about. You know, one of my band members moved out to LA as an um, illustrator mm -hmm. and he storyboards every, you know, you know, from movies to TV commercials before they get made. Um, I, I don't physically storyboard it, storyboard it but I, I think I do uh, mentally. You know, I mean, I, I really do think of it in those sorts of terms, you know, just like, um, in the introduction, what are you doing in the introduction? It's, it's the curtain has risen and the artist, the uh, audience is looking around and you know, what is the space and what's the mood and what's the environment and uh, what are the colors? And, you know, and then when the character comes in, you know, we're, it's part of our brain to uh, read people and to um, evaluate people and so forth. So, you know, who is this character? Are they familiar, are they unfamiliar? Do we believe them? What's their attitude? How close? How distant? What room are they in? What, what's their mood? So I, I think mentally I do that. And of course, if you had a play where the curtain comes up and it's one set and there's two people sitting in a chair, uh, unless it's Brecht, uh, you know, uh, you probably expect that to change, right? You don't want to sit there for three minutes or two hours while two people sit in the chair and nothing happens. So. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's really, how do you make things happen and how does the story unfold? You know, so it's the same thing, like where you, you have an establishment of a situation and then this exposition as things happen. And then there at the end, there may or may not be resolution. So, yeah, I definitely encourage maximum doodling in the studio. That's one of the things that really disappeared a lot with computers, you mm -hmm. know, um, with, with mixing on a console with analog tape you've got the tape strip. I and mean, we used to make the most gorgeous doodles on the tape um, strip, you know, the, the, uh, the track console tape. And um, that's, that sort of has disappeared a bit, you know, unless you're mixing on analog, you know, or mixing on consoles. Yeah. All right. So um, here's another one. They just keep coming in here. This one's from Kenneth Owen and Kenneth says many options available for the next step up from garage band. How do I decide which one is right for me to try next? <laughs> Hmm. Um, I, well, luckily there are free trials of most of these things. Uh, if you're doing work that you're going to want to hand off to other people or be able to do work that other people can hand off to you, Pro Tools is still the, the yeah. main platform. Uh, but there's so many great platforms out there. I would try them and see what works for you. I, people like Studio One and they like uh, Luna and, and so on. Um, it's... Uh, I, because I've been teaching with a mask on, my wife made me a sign that I could hold up because people can't see my expression. They don't, nobody knows what I'm kidding anyway. So I have, I have this one um, and, <laughs> and this one, but I, I have an answer to Kenneth's question, which is um, the answer to pretty much what well, I also have this sign, which is pretty much the answer to every audio question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which is not all that helpful. It, it really depends on, on what suits you and how you like to work and, and the, 
you know, the speed at which you like to work and how visual you want to be. And are you doing loop based stuff? You know, would you be happier in Ableton and machine or, yeah, you know, reason or something like that. So I think I would try them out and, uh, and see it's, yeah. it's a difficult question to answer. It's sort of like what, you know, what's the, what, you know, I need a new car and what's, what was, what's the best one. So, so a couple of thoughts on that. One is I do think that, um, if you see somebody out there making the records you like, and it seems like they're using a tool, there's probably a good reason for it and it's worth checking out. And two is definitely try the demos on things for, for DAWs, for um, plugins, but good, good Lord, don't demo them all at once. Pick one, thing, put one plugin or one DAW on your calendar and say, I'm going to start demoing this one and don't demo the next one until you've, you know, used up your, your seven days or your 14 days or whatever, because I can't tell you how many times I, I thought I wanted to check out plugins and then I would download like all the waves plugins at once. And then I never got a chance to try them and then it was too late, you know? <laughs> so give yourself one at a time. Should we take another question? And then I'll speed talk through the rest of it, or do we have, or do you have many questions? I'm happy. We, to uh, we do on. actually have many questions coming in. They're coming in fast. I'm happy to go as long as. Cool. Let's just keep going with questions. Um, Donnie um, again says, uh, "Oh, he was just reiterating his other thing, um, saying should we know more about what the artists used during the recording?" I think I think you already answered that. So. Okay. We'll move on from that. Andy um, said, "A point made on paying attention to the recording." rough mix if you're being employed as a mixer and had nothing to do with the recording if the artist is employing you for your sound how far away from the recorded sounds could or should you stray i think that's a great question yeah that's that's a great question for sure um it's it's it depends uh sometimes you know i think it's it really goes back to the communication thing which is uh you need to diplomatically find out if, they're, uh, if the rough mixes represent close to the, what they're looking for and they, they want you to sort of start there or make a more polished version of that or for heaven's sake, you know, compete with it, which is what we often end up doing because they've listened to the rough mix forever. Um, or if they're really, they go, and we've gotten it to a certain point, but we really want a, a different take on it. So that's where the communication comes in. Um, a lot of times what I'll do, and I think, again, it, it's, it changes depending on the situation. A lot of times what I'll do is when I get it, I'll just evaluate it, you know, if it's already in Pro Tools, which is what I'm using these days, I'll just bring it up and listen. And if it's, and then just sort of let my instincts kick in and, and see if, you know, it's like, oh, that, that thing doesn't work or that should have come in in the third verse and so forth um, without being swayed by the rough mix the way they are. One of the advantages you have when you're mixing some, somebody else's record is you haven't sat through uh, the entire process and you also don't, um, you don't uh, get overly attached to things or you get attached to things like, wow, this is that one part that we, uh, you, you know, we spent an hour getting this part. And if the part doesn't work, one of the advantages you have is a mixture that comes in after the fact is go, you know, that part doesn't work. And if, if it really doesn't work, then you may have to have the guts to mute it or change it. So, yeah. um, and, and then typically after, so that's the way that I'll typically do is I'll kind of go my own way and then I'll, I'll go, okay, now I, I'm partway there. I'm going to listen to the, uh, to the rough and go, oh, oh, I see. They, they intended that tambourine to be way in the background, or they intended uh, the, the background vocals to be the same level as the lead vocal and not behind them or something like that. And then, and then you go, okay, does that work or not? And then communication, you know, what do you think? Uh, these days we do so much mixing by ourselves that we're sending to clients. Um, I, I enjoy having clients there while we're mixing, although everybody can get a bit deadened to what's going on, but just because I can sort of watch them out of the corner of my eye and we can have conversations in real time and, and, and uh, make the mixing as much a creative process as the production process. Um, okay, here's another one. This one comes from Will um, Keensel and, and Will says, you know, Will. Hi, Will. Will. Will says, while mixing for an artist, not yourself, do you think it's better to have their, have your own sound or to help the artist find their own sound? It's, a, it's the same topic. If mm -hmm. you have a sound, does it muddle what the artist you're working um, for was trying to accomplish? And I want to add to that too, when you're talking about communication, what about the times when you listen to the artist and they tell you that they really want it to sound like Tame Impala, but the more you go in that direction, 
And the closer it gets, the more they undo all of that by the time you're back to the final mix. And it just sounds like, you know, uh, um, a clearer version of the original rough mix. Yeah. Well, it's, it's tricky, you know, because uh, it, it depends on the dynamics of the whole situation, uh, especially if there's a producer or if the band is a producer and they're, and you're, I mean, if you're the mixer, you should have creative input and creative ability. Um, but if you're being made the sort of de facto producer, then I think I, I would tend to use all the diplomacy and communication to um, maybe talk people out of going uh, directions that are wrong for them. I'm thinking of, of the, the analogy, which is if you're a, a barber and somebody comes in and says, you know, can you make me look like Brad Pitt? And you're like, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you don't look like Brad Pitt. Here's the good news. You look like you and you're beautiful. And, uh, and we're going to take everything that's beautiful and, and, and amplify that. And that's the same with the recording. I mean, part of our job might be to, uh, to give them courage to, to not just emulate somebody else and to go their own way. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, the real process of mixing, you would think is twiddling knobs or pushing a mouse or something like that. But really that's just all an expression of the jointly derived vision or if they've entrusted you with it, then your derived vision of it. Um, to the point of, you know, should we have our own sound? Um, that's a tricky one. It's actually almost a business question. And it's also a philosophical and personality question. Some people uh, are hired because they have a sound, right? Especially, well, yeah, especially like in hip hop and R&B where the, the so-called producers basically the songwriter and beat maker and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, sometimes people are hired for their sound and sometimes um, the person, you know, I, for say producers or producer mixers, I tend to, my personal taste is I like the ones who, uh, you can't tell that that's the person that makes it because I feel like they're putting themselves in the, in the movie frame and not being the, the frame around it. So I tend to really love productions where I don't notice the production. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. It, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the superimposed sound on it. Um, and then Mark just jumped in with a comment saying, Lidge, I can't help but think of Phil Spector mixing Let It Be by the Beatles, which maybe, yeah. uh, I don't, is that an example of it doesn't have the sound or is that an example of it does have the sound? Well, the question is whose sound? Right? <laughs> uh, Paul McCartney was not happy about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, that that's not good from an interpersonal business point of view, not that that was something that Phil Spector was particularly concerned with. Um, I suppose you could say it was successful commercially, but it's, yeah. it's you know, we're talking such a complicated uh, factor, right? It's vector geometry with about 250 different vectors of the interpersonal stuff and the record company and the manager and the significant others of the band and, and your feeling and, and, you know, what you've been into lately and what you've been listening to and what the drummer's been listening to. So it, it is, that is the complicated dance that really is this process. And it's a process that extends, like I said, beyond just the mechanical parts of mixing. Um, we've got, we got some more questions, but you want me to, you want me to just ask one or two and then we'll jump into some more teaching and, and circle back for more questions or. Perfect. Okay, great. So here's one from Ben. Ben says, um, would you suggest creating a listener avatar and then mixing for that specific listener to keep a consistent vision for the song? So I think that's fascinating, Ben, because when I, when Mark was talking about having the vision, I thought about the concept of an avatar, which is suggested for starting a podcast, for example, or a business. You know, It's like, who are you speaking to? Absolutely. I, I mean, I, what I always say uh, when we're analyzing music in this classroom, for example, is like, how many characters are in, are in this story? Is it one person confessionally singing? Is it a whole choir of people? Is it one person with a choir? There's always one other person in, the, in, the, in this communication process that is a song, and that's the listener. Uh, and I suppose with some genres, you can go, okay, I know what, who this listener is and what they're looking for. And you know, they're a fan of this band and they, this is what they want to hear. Then you have to make a decision. Am I going to just give them, completely fulfill their expectations? Am I going to surprise them? Am I going to risk alienating them? So you can, you can also tie yourself into knots doing that. Um, but you, know, you, you have to realize that we think we're communicating perfectly and we're making this record that everybody's going to, that we put out in the world and that's just going to be a thing. 
the thing is everybody brings their own story and their own biography to it. And that's the other half of the communication. So if it's something that resonates with them and they relate to it, that's because of their experience. We have no idea how they're going to perceive it. Uh, so from a pure artistic point of view, my feeling is let's make ourselves happy and, and, and uh, create, I'll say, an authentic portrayal of an emotion. Uh, and then just hope that some people resonate with it. Because, you know, a lot of the music business has gone in a direction that uh, I think is ill, ill, ill informed and ill intentioned, uh, which is, oh, let's make something that's as um, accessible to everybody and that as many people will like as possible. And so, in so doing, let's go to a mall and drag in 12 ordinary citizens, of which there's no such thing, and play them some music and see. And if, if the largest number of people like it, that's how it should be. Uh, and my feeling is if you get a dozen citizens in there and uh, 10 of them hate it and two of them will spend anything to get a copy of it, you have a success, right? And so I think uh, we have to be careful about trying to please other people who aren't in the room too much. But, you know, there is there's business involved and um, yeah, it, it, is, it is interesting to see, you know, how do we open the door? How many people are we going to lose in the process? Yeah, well, Mark, you scored, man. You got more than two people on this this class today. So well done. <laughs> um, okay, th this will be the last one, and then we'll then we'll keep moving forward. This one's from Jeff. Um, and we will circle back for the rest of the questions later. Um, this is from Jeff. Jeff says, uh, "Thanks for doing this. What mics are you guys using today?" So I think we're but we're using the same brand of mic, right? That that's a Lewitt as well, isn't it? This is a beautiful Lewitt LCT two forty Pro, and it is white, uh, and it has a my glasses. Super boss, uh, mine the, and uh, mine do I sound sexy? Hello, hello. Do I sound awesome? One, two. Hey. I do what everybody else does. There this is go. the LTC six forty right here. Oh yeah, Authentica. Great sounding mic. Indeed. Thanks for thanks for asking, Jeff. Um, okay, cool. So you want to move on, and we'll we'll um, circle back with more questions after. Let's you do it. Okay. Uh, Sorry that I have to. Um, Thanks for all the questions, Rockstars. Those, those are great and keep them coming. Okay. Uh, sorry that I have to go through all these points here that we covered before, but that way you can see my smiling face. It's a good review for us, right? Exactly. This could be a, a test later because, you know, I am a teacher. Thanks for doing this. This is fun. Yeah, man. Thanks for putting together such a fantastic presentation. Oh, I hope people are enjoying it. Uh, they're lucky because usually each of these points involves a, a half an hour of talking and uh, playing songs that illustrate all these points and so forth. Um, this is a partly true statement. So listening and feeling is more important than doing. I think I've already made that point. Uh, but I think that a lot of people think they're not actually doing anything if they're not actively pushing stuff around and being a person of action. But really all of that is an expression of what you think and feel in the first place. Um, the second part is debatable, but mixing can, which is why I say can be. Mixing can be the process of narrowing the difference between what you hear in your head and heart and what comes out of the speakers. That's like you have the vision, you think you know what the song wants to be, and then you hear how it's coming out of the speakers, and you can try to narrow that while being prepared for the There are all these parameters that you can, uh, that you can uh, address, right? Uh, and it's funny because a lot of the the most simplest one right there's here's a mixing console what's the thing that they put closest to you that they expect you to use the most volume controls right faders um it's funny that these days people uh if something doesn't sound right they just start compressing and so forth so uh so you can balance the volume you can pan things left and right you can place things front and back in both in the recording or in the mixing process uh you can stratify the frequencies from low to high uh, you have, you know, there's clean stuff, there's distorted stuff. It can move, it can stay in place. It can be, um, and you can mute it and so forth. So all of those parameters are, are the things that we, uh, that we manipulate in, in the mixing process. Um, that said, the word balanced is loaded because sometimes the, the mix is going to work is going to be something where it's, wow, that is way too loud or gee, the vocals are buried. Uh, but it, it's not like this is a technical thing where somebody's gonna go, oh, the vocal is 12.2 decibels louder than the rest of the mix, therefore you win and here's your Grammy, right? On some country music, the vocal is just starkly out in front of everything and that's perfect. On some other music, REM, 
uh, the vocalist is, is, you know, lots of music, the vocalist is kind of buried in the music. And that affects the experience of the listener. I mean, li literally, physically, they might have to do this because you're listening in for the, the human part. Um, so it's a, it, balancing doesn't mean everything has to be perfect. Um, it's easy to think about, okay, I got the mix for the chorus, I got the mix for the verse, I got the mix in the bridge, and back when songs had solos, I got that, right? Um, but think about the transition points between those. How do you build into the chorus? How does it come out of the chorus? How does it go up to the, to the big uh, part? Do you have sudden dynamic transitions? Do you have a lot of telegraphing that's gonna happen? Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, right? Um, everybody always thinks about volume when they're thinking about mixing, you know? Can I hear everything? Is this too loud? Is that too soft? Does it sound, you know, and killer and all that stuff? Um, but mixing also affects the rhythmic part. And a lot of music is actually about groove more than it's about anything else. Or it's as much about groove as it is about the lyrics, for example, um, the Rolling Stones, right? Or whoever. Um, it's about the feel and you change the rhythmic feel and the danceability and all that with the mix. Um, you know, how much emphasis are you going to put on the backbeat? If you compress it, you would just think, oh, I'm just going to compress the snare drum. If you change the, the attack of it and its relationship, or you bring up the body of it, and you're effectively bring, changing the length of it, it changes the relationships of everything in time. Uh, and of course, that affects it rhythmically. Context is everything. Um, avoid the solo button. I, you know, the solo button is useful for, um, you know, I've got a problem, there's a buzz. Oh, what is the frequency that's, that's muddying things up or whatever. But uh, I really encourage you to not spend a lot of time listening to the snare drum by itself because it doesn't matter. Uh, a snare drum that sounds great by itself might not work in the context of the mix. Something that sounds clangy and horrible by itself might be the perfect one for the mix. So I really think uh, more and more these days, I don't even start with the drums or start with the kick drum or whatever. I push all the faders up, I get the context going and then mold from there. Um, Can I add something to that? Please. So I find that soloing, uh, sometimes mixing is like being in a crowded bar and you're trying to listen to the person have a conversation across the table. Yep. I like to think of soloing as that thing that just makes me not have to struggle to listen through for, for something I'm just trying to see. Is that the thing that's doing this, you know, this problem? And I find the mute button is actually just as effective. Just mute something and then see if you, whatever was bugging you goes away. Um, so that's, that's what I was going to say. A hundred percent. And again, is mixing just doing and, and throwing plugins and turning knobs and, and, and looking like your person of action? Or, uh, you know, it, one, I guess one of my main points is it's really a, a listening process. And the, all the stuff you're doing is in response to what you're hearing. Uh, and you have to exercise your, what you're just talking about, your audio zoom lens, where you can, you know, the, we're hearing two pieces of air pressure, two levels of air pressure, one at each ear, and we're extracting everything else, left, right, front, back, low, high, and all the stuff I talked about. Um, it's amazing that we have the ability, because we're just hearing sound pressure here, sound pressure here, to go, oh, you know, is that shaker too loud? And to be able to listen in mentally, you know, uh, which is completely a mental process, not like our ears do anything, right? Um, to be able to zoom in, um, and that's amazing, but it's harder for many people to zoom out again. So I think what a lot of people do, especially when they're new to mixing is they zoom in, I think, oh, is this fine? And then they zoom in, is this the right frequency? And then they end up with their nose pressed to the canvas. Uh, and the, the hard part is, you know, can you zoom yourself back out and go, okay, is it, how's it working effectively? Uh, it's good, but there's something fighting in the low end. And then you zoom in, what is it? It's, it's on the right. Okay, oh, it's the floor tom and the bass guitar. Okay, what frequency gets specific? But then the part that people forget is, then you zoom out and you go, does it, does it work? So, um, Yeah, and that reminder, you can't be both zoomed in and out at the same time. It's always you're yeah. either one or the other. Yeah, you might be able to do it quickly, but yeah. Uh, beware the butterfly effect. This is something, again, that I usually talk about at great length, but uh, you're, sitting, you're going along, how's the mix sound? Pretty good. Make sure you uh, bounce it out then or, or save that uh, as a version. But beware the butterfly effect, which you go, oh, okay, I think it's really good. Now all I need to do is add some low end to the snare drum. And you add some low end to the snare drum, that seems good. And then a few minutes later you go, you know, it seems like the vocal is, is, is a little bit um, quiet now because you brought up the low end of the snare drum and it's covering up. 
I should just turn that up. And then you go, now I'm not hearing enough of the bass drum. And now the bass guitar is up. And now I don't have the cymbals. And it, this whole butterfly effect can sort of spread through. You could do one small action, which can uh, cause everything to, to topple. So be careful of that. Um, this is tricky. And again, it's, it's a, mainly an interpersonal thing, which is if, and you might just ask your client, is it okay with you if I do, uh, if I change stuff around, if I think it's going to help the song? Uh, and there's also the idea of, well, it's better just ask forgiveness. So maybe just do it and don't tell them about it. Uh, I have a tendency to go pretty, ext do extreme things on mixes. You know, they, I, I mean, I've had songs sent to me and I go, you know, this intro is 16 measures. It just takes too long. I'm going to cut out eight measures. <laughs> you know, I mean, I literally like rearrange the song. I'll play parts in, I'll remove parts. They have something they played all the way through the song and I decide, you know, I think it's going to work better. I mean, this is production, really. I think it's going to work better if we just hold it so that we can have something happen until the end or the third verse, or it's only going to happen in one section. Um, these are great tools. Just because they record it doesn't mean you have to use everything that you're given. Um, and the mute switch is very powerful. And a lot of times the problem is because people can and we're not limited to a small number of tracks, people just throw in the kitchen sink and then your job is supposed to be somehow sort through it. Uh, and sometimes you have to. So if it's like, oh, wow, this section is too short, maybe add it, or there, there's, you know, there are parts here where there's just nothing happening, well, uh, make something happen. Fly, fly in, you know, find another take, fly in another version of the solo, whatever it takes. Um, really hard, easy to say, hard to uh, do. Try not to overwork stuff. You'll know when you get, the, well, you know after you've gotten there, but uh, it's possible sometimes to work so hard and be so tweaky and knock down all the rough edges and, and take all the life out of something. So every so often take breaks and listen to other stuff, take a walk. Um, despite all, all this, what sounds like this very ponderous process that I have, I, I usually mix a song in about an hour probably, you know, because despite all, everything that I've said, it all happens instinctively. Um, you know, so I've, had, I've been happy with my own mixing results where, because I used to be very microscopic and deliberate. And now when I just kind of go in, like I say, work gesturally, like, Oh, yeah, too much this, too little that. Let's shape this, you know, take that, um, create gestures and exaggerate stuff because if it gets mastered, it may, uh, it'll get flattened out and stuff that you think is major because you see a fader move in Pro Tools or whatever. Um, it is not as major as you think it is. Sometimes you have to over exaggerate things. And we're going to have to stop pretty soon because my Mac is almost dead. So I'll plug it in here in a second. And we got um, a few more questions to close out. Great. Here's an important point. Mixing isn't preventing things from happening. It's making things happen. Okay. I think a lot of people think mixing is, oh, that's too loud. I have to turn it down. Oh, there's too much of this. Oh, I couldn't possibly put this much of this on there. Um, and it's, don't think of it as this sort of like safety thing. And, oh, I don't want to be, take any risks or be laughed at. I have to homogenize everything. It's really more the opposite, which is make stuff more extreme, push things forward, make stuff happen, you know, uh, entrances, exits, action. That's what somebody wants in any kind of entertainment we have to, or, you know, anything they could spend their time with. Uh, and, and we're competing with every recording that's ever been named. Competing is a bad word, but they have the capability of, see, of seeing or listening to everything that's basically ever been done. Um, and uh, so awesome. that's, uh, and I think this is, this could be my last point. Maybe this is my next to last point. Um, listen like a fan, not a critic. Um, I'm going to go to my, uh, even though I know I look sexy in this camera, uh, I'm going to go to the uh, camera on my Mac. Hang on. Here, tap dance and say something for a second. There. Okay, cool. Um, well, you know, one of the questions you mentioned, um, working fast and uh, working in an hour, which, um, you know, my question around that would be, do you need to be sort of templated? Do you need to have a process that makes it easy for you to not waste any time on technical stuff to be able to work fast? And can and do you feel like you can work fast with the mouse or is it work fast when you're working on a desk and you got knobs, which um, goes along with Donnie's first the question, first question to ask here, which is, um, you know, what are your thoughts on mixing out of the box with hardware? Whatever serves you the best. Um, it, and, and there are, again, it's, it's again, it's sort of like mixing. There are multiple factors to be, to be balanced. It's really whatever ser serves you the best. And of course, you can afford. 
if you like to have your, you know, I mix for decades on a console. Uh, these days, I mostly mix on a laptop at the kitchen table. I just don't tell my clients because uh, that way I get to hang out with my wife and, even, and I'm in headphones. You know, I've got PMCs and an API console in my backyard. Uh, and I'm, I'm mostly mixing completely in the box on headphones. And I'm happy with results. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, not even, I'm not using controller. I'm mixing with a, a touchpad and a, and a trackball. Uh, I'm perfectly happy doing it. So I think it's a personal thing, whatever works. Um, you know, I love, I'll, I'll mix through anything. You know, I love mixing through consoles. I love real outboard gear, but I like to capture it that way. Uh, I love working in the box a lot more than I thought I would. Um, and I'm mainly because I think the hardest part of mixing is maintaining perspective and the ability to go, to get to a certain point on it and go, I'm not hearing the song anymore. My ears have kind of gone dead or I'm hearing my expectation or, or what I think the song is as opposed to how it actually is. That's a time to either take a break or go to something else, refresh your palate, and then, then you can come back on, on it an hour later the next day and go, oh, obviously, this, the snare drum's too loud, the vocal has too much reverb, whatever it is. Um, yeah, So great. Shall I go to the next one? Let, let me just talk about listen like a fan, not a critic, and then we'll see, I think there might be one more point will be done. So listen like a fan, which is, you know, um, there's a different mode of listening when different modes of listening when you're mixing. Um, and I think what everybody does is what I call the furrowed brow method, which kind of goes with the preventing things from happening. They're sitting there like this going, okay, what's, what's wrong with my mix? What, what, you know, what, what am I going to get laughed at? Or, you know, uh, what's wrong with this thing? And they're sitting there with their brows furrowed between and trying to identify all the things that are wrong. Hopefully, no, nobody who's going to buy this song or stream it or listen to it is sitting there going, yeah, I'd kind of like this song, but, you know, if only it had been 2.4K instead of 3.2K, that would, you know, uh, you know, I just disagree with their choice of a Fairchild instead of the 76 or virtual ones. Only um, if it was a Beatles box set re-release. with Exactly. Happen. Yeah. But um, so I think to the same extent that we have reference monitoring where we're going to listen, try to listen to speakers similar to the ones that people are going to be listening to at home. Um, that we can get an idea, you know, it's great if it sounds wonderful in a computer designed room that, you know, but if nobody else is going to hear it that way, that's maybe less relevant. So I think it's useful to uh, take those filters off and not sit there thinking what's wrong with it, but to listen like, listen like a fan and go, um, my last point, which is, uh, the question that you ask, you ask yourself isn't how does it sound or what's wrong? Um, you, know, you know, especially what's wrong because, yeah, um, you know, or, or even how does it sound? Oh, well, it's, it's too, it's bright or dull or, or I looked at it on the scope and it doesn't, it's not the exact same as this Peter Gabriel record or whatever. Um, how does it feel? And is, is that the feeling that we're going for in the first place? You know, does it make you, do, does it realize whatever the, the tone and the, and the story and the message, message might be? You know, uh, does it make you happy, sad? Does it make you want to dance? Does it make you angry? Does it make you want to uh, boogie, right? Does it make you um, meditative and whatever? You know, how does it feel? And then you can always go into all the rest of the stuff um, as far as the particulars, you know, but that's the overall idea is, you know, because that's what the, uh, most of the people who are going to hear it are going to, are going to, think you know it's like ultimately if they want to hear it again it's because it made them feel a certain way that's what we're doing really we're delivering emotion yeah i think that's great great reminder um here's me let me jump in we've got a couple more questions and then we have gone for a good long stretch so this has been really awesome mark thank you so much for being here and doing this so here's glad. one from jim jim uh, brant says ex-student of Mark's from, uh, from more years ago than I want to admit here. I've been dogging Mark recently on this question because I haven't gotten back into recording or because I have gotten back into recording. Good. Uh, for a rock studio, what are the next two or three mics after 57, 58s and SM7? Ooh, let's see, it's a good one. Uh, rock studio. So we're talking bass, drums and guitar. Uh, so the uh, as always, it depends. So, 50 sorry, after 57, 58, and SM7, 
Yeah. Uh, those, so that covers snare drum and possibly electric guitar and, and vocal, you know, SM7, uh, possibly a, a kick drum mic. So the Lewitt kick drum mic is awesome. Uh, and then there are various other ones that are, that are really great. And there's some that I don't like, but that work for everybody else. Anyway, um, Tom uh, mics. So, yeah, so yeah, and maybe some Tom mics. Although you know, it's amazing what you can do with fifty sevens, fifty eights. You know, I think most people would say uh, either a, some, either like a, a pair of ribbons for overheads or a su single ribbon, uh, and it could be anything. Uh, there's so many great ones these days, uh, both modern and old. Uh, and then a lot of people would say uh, some sort of a condenser microphone, either for that flavor on voice or or for overheads. Um, you know, something nice and large. Uh, there are so many great options out there uh, that I can barely think of. That makes a great overhead too. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, uh, for a room mic, uh, everybody should own Electro Voice 635A. It's the, it's, we call them hammers, although the, that's not the, the original Buchanan hammer, but uh, they're, you, they should be under hundred bucks. It's a great utility mic. It makes a great mono overhead, but it's, it's a really good room mic or chamber mic. And by chamber, I mean your stairwell, your garage, your bathroom. It's an Omni as well, Omni it's dynamic. An Omni, it's cheap. It, it's, we call them hammers because you can hammer nails into two by fours without any lasting effects. Um, but it, it's actually a very useful mic. Um, possibly a good idea to also um, get like a PZM. Uh, yeah. You know, because they're, inexpensive and they do they do good things you could tape it on the drummer's chest you could put it out in the room put it against the wall hang it on the ceiling and uh it's uh that's a useful thing too uh put them on the floor out in front of the drum kit yeah yeah i was gonna say um and you can get use sony lavalier mics pretty inexpensively and they're they're great for acoustic guitar and they make a great hi-hat mic if you into miking the hi-hat there was also that um, great mic you suggested. It was a, it was a Nady something or other, yeah, yeah. really inexpensive mic that was very cool sounding. I uh, got it immediately when you were on the podcast and we started messing with it on drums. Yeah, I, I'm a proponent of the Nady SP5, these star powers. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't make them anymore. Unfortunately, I paid 10 bucks for mine and they, they're the stunt mics when we want to you know use them as drumsticks and uh, tape them to things and stuff like that. Uh, right. they're, they're surprisingly good microphones, really. Uh, I've, I've been buying, you know, the, uh, and you should also have at least one uh, really inexpensive unbalanced microphone. And I recommend the Akai series of ADM. Uh, there's a, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I think goes down to nine or whatever. It's just a, a pretty cheesy, I think it's a ceramic unbalanced microphone. Very useful for rock recording because you plug it into uh, any guitar pedal, metal zone, rat pedal, distortion pedal, anything, and then plug that into a direct box. And that could be the thing that brings all the rock to the record. And they should be under 20 bucks. Very cool. I love it. All right, dude, we've got one final question here. Wow. This is from Sergio Paoletti. Sergio, let me know if I said your name right. Hopefully I did. Hey, Sergio. Um, the setup of this vision in a mix is something you go for very quickly in the process and then focus in details or is it something you build slowly along hours of work? I think he was <clears throat> talking about your ability to like kind of come up with a vision for what this is. Is this sort of like quick and you like come up with an idea and go for it? Yeah, for me, it's instantaneous. Uh, you know, to the extent if I'm the producer or uh, if I'm just a producer, this isn't something that I sit down and, and write out and have chapters, stuff like that. Basically, like if I'm producing and I hear a demo of a song, I hear it done in my head. I mean, I hear the final mix really. Uh, and then everything that, that I'm doing is, is trying to approach that while still being open for diversions or uh, happy surprises. But uh, yeah, it's not something that I, that I really, uh, that, that I, that I labor over, but you know, it also comes from a lifetime of reading and uh, listening to music and that kind of thing. So it's yeah. a little bit like the way that a jazz saxophonist would, would uh, improvise, right? They're, Yes, they might have their licks that they've been practicing, but if they're doing it well, they're, they're in the moment is happening in real time, right? But it's also based on all the studying and all the listening and everything they've ever heard from, from everywhere. So, uh, but the short answer, the blessedly short answer too late is uh, for me, it's instantaneous. 
That's great. Um, well, Mark, thank you for, for doing this with us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. You've been going for a solid hour and a half. So we'll give you a break because I know you finished a long day of teaching as well. Um, we got a few comments. Up. People are just saying, um, you know, Dave says a truckload of gratitude. Randy says, um, thanks for doing this and thanks for being here. And also he hopes to see you at um, Summer NAM. So, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be more connecting then as, as we're back to having fun and, um, you know, being in studios and stuff like that. Um, and I want to give a big thank you also to you rock stars for joining us on this. Thank you so much for being here. This, without you guys, this, this is, a, you know, we, we're not doing anything. So thank you for doing this with us. And a shout out and a thank you to OWC and Artist Relations for also helping to put this together. And of course, to Blackbird Academy for being an incredible resource. And, um, you know, I think that's Blackbird in the background of your shot there. And I, I love the, uh, the colorful graffiti on the walls. So it's a, a non-virtual background. Yeah. Mark, do you have any, any final closing words for everybody? Thanks so much for listening to me and joining us. Thank you, Lidge. This is really wonderful. Thanks to OWC. Thanks to Randy and Tanya Fuchs. Really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'll just say this, something that I say a lot in recording studios. Uh, don't forget to have fun. This should be a, a fun, this is a fun and creative process. So um, approach it in a, in a joyful way and, uh, and, you know, make great art. Yeah, and dress for the occasion, rock stars. From now on. Let's see your tie, Mark. Uh, this was a gift to me from one Nico Bolas. It has Buffalo Bill on it. Very nice. Yeah. All right. Ciao, rock stars. Enjoy your evening and have a great weekend coming up. And thanks for watching. We'll see you guys around the studio. Cheers. Peace and love.